might get going anyway. So if you can just keep trying and we'll just cut it when it's oh. Maybe should we just record on the speaker? Okay, because I think people want to record on um, Sorry, that was me. Well, we might just record on TC. Scratch that. Have you got camera issues? Do you want to? Uh, oh, no, we'll just. Because we got to get going, so we'll. Thank you. Is it got plenty of room? The only thing is, maybe both of you have been around, sorry. Is it. These cameras only record up to 30 minutes, and it'll stop, so you have to press record again. I've got a webcam. Uh, we, we just got to get going, so. Maybe it needed an SD card. Ah, oh, sweet. Okay, cool. Cool. Am I in? Is it all me? Okay. Okay, right. Um, so I'll just give a quick wee intro and I'll pass it over to you guys. Um, um, so this is Grapple 2023, week, week two. can go and uh, de-stress and improve the mental health. Um, uh, in order to create the lively atrium, uh, we need ways of germinating plants, we need some uh, we need the water fertilizers and monitoring systems. Um, I've been in charge of looking at the feasibility of this project. I've made sure that we have all the different minerals, all the water, the atmosphere, that sort of stuff to make sure the plant is going to thrive. In my design, I included a seating area where the lichens are able to relax and observe the beach for longer. The atrium will aid in helping with mental health by making the Martians feel less homesick, de stress, and as well as boost the morale. Hi, I'm Josh. I designed the pods that will house the uh, plants so we can facilitate the amount of growth we'll need for the plants. They will house the um, my main so focus of the design was to keep the growth we'll need for visually the plants so the house so how uh, so the so so my main so focus of the design was to keep the growth we'll need for the plants we just made house the materials to make this project I've done this by essentially getting a lot of the materials to get as a house so we can be able to collaborate so we can complete just everyone in the Hi, I'm Tyler. I've uh, been doing all the coding for this project. Uh, my goal has been trying to take all of our information from our sensors, map it out in a way that we can use it to fuel our arms with all the energy they require to grow big and strong, big foot and tire, and send that information to a separate place where we can observe it and then see trends and stuff with growing plants on the 
So it's full designing of the of the pod, uh, which was used obviously for the prior kit, is used to facilitate and help with the amount of drugs on the for these eight um, I used to have a couple ideas for design. Mainly, as I said, focus on the visual aspect side of it. So making it look quite nice in the front, quite sleek, slim, tender, but also allow them to be functional by adding, for example, a like uh, the ventilation system. We've got water, something, and uh, by establishing a plant incubating system that has uh, preset conditions for the different plants, we have the ability to upscale um, this to a full-on farming. Um, not only does our product create an atrium that benefits from mental health of uh, the inhabitants and the cosmonauts, it uh, simulates an extraterrestrial ecosystem that scientists can monitor, gather data, and see what works on Mars with different gravity to atmosphere and stuff like that. And it will help uh, in the future creating sustainable food sources. Um, one main benefit. Oh, sorry, I'm not. <laughs> oh, one main benefit is connection. Our atrium will enable Martians to form a connection with nature. And studies show that forming connection with nature usually will make you happier in life and express positive emotions. Therefore, this means the atrium will potentially have a positive impact on our Martians' Martian mental health. Um, another benefit are the materials. So, Martians are able to source different materials from these nutrients, such as flora, greenery, and fruit from the trees. And the last benefit is that the uh, resources will be much more accessible, and the Martians will have to transport as many resources from Earth to Mars. Uh, so, as you probably wonder what's inside, we have our two little plants, uh, Derek and Bob. Uh, so, as you probably wonder what's inside, we have our two little plants, uh, Derek and Bob. So, as you probably wonder what's inside, we have our two little plants, Derek and Bob. So, as you probably wonder what's inside, we have our two little plants, Derek and Bob. I've had to incorporate a lot of different design aspects into this, some of them being the pumping system, our air system, and our light system. I've essentially made a little mainframe where we essentially encapsulate all of these different control methods into one centralized board, so we can then control the environment. Uh, our first piece here would be the pump, uh, which is essentially just like a pump, it will, uh, when needed, uh, it flow water into the chamber through a uh, spray nozzle, allowing water to then essentially fumigate the chamber 
and while increasing the humidity and increasing the moisture content of the soil when needed, uh, that is controlled by the moisture sensor, which when it detects that the soil has gone below a certain value within or above a certain value, will then uh, in increase the moisture content in the chamber. Uh, then we have the, the, uh, the air systems inside of the chamber, which work by pumping air in. Uh, essentially, the CO2 of the chamber that the plants require to grow, and that is monitored by a CO2 temperature sensor. Uh, CO2 sensor. Um, this CO2 is, is, uh, this CO2 is pumped into the, this CO2 is pumped into, into the chamber through a couple different. Uh, this CO2 can be sourced from the outside atmosphere in low concentrations, or can be recycled from inside uh, from CO2 in the atrium, and we can use either one depending on if we actually have CO2 in the atrium at the time, or if we just want to have some plants to be able to grow uh, in the meantime, otherwise. Future possibilities. So from where I understand the future, where we can take this project for all of our group uh, is towards more, or on the pod, we can make it more um, functionality, uh, not full function, okay. More expandable, so more modularity, as in you can change the parameters of it slightly, and you can have this go infinitely long. You'd have hundreds of these set up in a room where you have you know, hundreds of different species and plants going together. Two minutes. Keep going. Two minutes. Oh, cool. Two minutes. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Really cool. Um, so, another thing I believe we should do is um, user friendliness. Currently, in its current form, it's not the greatest to repair. So, repairing would be a big thing for the final product, at least for the pod. And another. And just in general, being able to interface with it would be a good thing. So, this is like the like, concepts for the atrium like, originally. So, originally, we were going to do like a dome shape, but we realized when we were like, learning that it would be difficult to find something for the dome. So, we found it easier to just make it sort of a rectangular shape. And as you can see, there's like paths like, across the atrium, and there's various seating areas, and instead of paths, there'll be like different sections of paths and Alright, any questions? Just on the physical side, is the pump able to run? Or yeah, 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 yeah. It might have yeah. not to move some of my um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it ran while the lights were off. Yeah. 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 You can see it. I, I saw it. Yeah. Awesome. It does run. Uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's just quite hard to see simply yeah. because the uh, lights didn't come on, which is. Uh, it's always better to be efficient while back of the diet on it, which yeah. turns the lights off automatically. We can't solve the issue at the moment because we didn't realize that was a thing. And we then put it in and we realized, oh, that's a thing. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Um, you mentioned something about monitoring during the week, so can you just explain that? So were you basically just having a plant and just going, hey, will it actually survive in this enclosure for the number of days that you have? Is that what you were doing? Uh, yeah, so uh, there was two things I was doing while we were monitoring it. Um, I was looking at whether it needed water, being if the moisture is getting too high or in fact too low, um, so then I'm watering the plant and therefore keeping a good one uh, rate. I was also looking at because I found um, in the other room where I was growing it, in the corner I was growing it in, uh, this plant specifically, this type of plant, likes to have be around 40% moisture, and it would normally stay around 40% moisture. Um, the leaves would start to wilt if it got too high and too moist, and it would start drooping quite a lot if it got too low as well. So um, on Mars with low gravity and stuff like that, in a different atmosphere, uh, we'd be able to look at this using our monitoring and then change how we're Growing plants to fill yeah. yeah. You mentioned some of them. I feel like you you mentioned, you know, in reality, you quite have some moisture sink and moisture meters. Would you give opportunity to try and do any moisture meters and any more that plant? Yeah, we do I have moisture meters. I think what you're talking about was the pH sensors. Oh, yes, the pH sensors, yes. Okay, so, so 
the limit of the yeah. So the physical limitation of the pH sensor is that they are very big and very expensive at the moment. It's really hard to incorporate a, a, a um, component like that into our design. Instead, we've come up with two optimal solutions, which is in the future and not in our case of prototype. They could use the big bulky pH sensors that require complex chemistry to function, or they could use a standard pH method where you can essentially collect a soil sample, you can aggregate it in water, so just shake it up violently, and that will release the alkalines and the, uh, just the acids inside of the soil, which then allows it to be essentially you get a free acid based content which you can measure with pH strips to determine if you need to add or reduce any pH modifiers. And we can do that using natural sulfides, sulfates, and uh, limestone, which is naturally occurring inside of the upper mantle inside of mice. Um, and in terms of, um, so that was one big part. I really, by the way, I really like the whole mental health well being side of thing. I think that's a bit of a good idea. It's something that can easily get overlooked, especially if time management falls on Mars, um, in a small colony. Um, the other side of that project, what I see, is a bit around the growing system. And so, in, in this particular scenario, I take it that the Mars colony doesn't actually have a means of growing yet. Uh, the, the scenario we've said that um, they have uh, food supplies from Earth that are coming in, and we're trying to move away from that and be successful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, yes. Just a comment. We both were talking about how impressed we are with how you, um, how far you've come compared to yesterday. This is this is amazing. Thank you. It's been well. a long Thank stretch, you. and also like a lot of delays of print, you know, print quality and everything else. Right. Yeah, a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Well, that's lots of uh, lack of sleep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, thank you very much. No, I was I was going to say the same thing actually, guys. Like from where you were at the beginning of this challenge to where you were yesterday to where you are now, very very cool. I do have a question. Yes. Um, we talked throughout the week about what else this um, particular uh, solved solution can be used for. Did you have a good think about the other resources that can possibly go? I think a lot of people think that this could be a really cool place to chill out um, or a good place to grow a kite, but is there anything else that you fellas thought about in regards to what this could actually um, grow um, regarding resources for the colony? So the, the other alternative is once we have started looking at and monitoring um, how plants like to grow on Mars, we can actually start looking into and testing Martian soil <coughs> and start trying to move the plants outside and start rebuilding the atmosphere, start rebuilding the ozone. It's much harder than just saying it like that, but... Um, yes. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but the, we, can, we can monitor it using this and be able to grow our plants to fit and change our plants in, in the way that they're. One of, the, one of the things of the atrium is not only the mental health, but you can also create an ecosystem <coughs> and trying to get all these plant life to live together on Mars, and then maybe in the future maybe integrating some sort of uh, animal life, or some bacteria or stuff like that, to see what how it adapts into them. Another possibility, I believe, would be um, stuff like we could bring other animals down for scientific research. There'd be a lot of that going into this. It's be very important to see how you know we can colonize Mars in the future, seeing how life adapts to the low environment, different gravity, and stuff like that. And we can also, um, you know, use the space, once we get that whole ecosystem of wildlife, we can use it for other resources such as, you know, um, so like silk and maybe create yeah. fabric yeah, and paint wood. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. by no means so it would be quite, quite an interesting job. There's other materials okay. that we You're should up. Uh, Tetai will provide us with so oh, yeah. many different options and things in case of thousands of years. Yeah. So um, we can take the the, the the part of thinking from you know thousands of years of us being yeah. on the planet and, and utilize that for two different other materials and other other resources for us. Love it. Thanks. Well awesome. done. Cheers. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did you make it? <laughs>
The um <laughs> like radio modules and stuff um, with off, like yeah off the shelf and all the sensor stuff but they did all the coding stuff. What about the conversations? Uh, yeah, the same as the outfit. I know that's what I mean. Like, it looks clean. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, you should definitely try and get to yeah. see if I look at it. I think I heard yeah, yeah, and it like sends stuff to the other things, like that, which is do stuff as well. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was going to introduce you, but I was busy. No, no, you guys are show us. Yeah. So our group name is somewhat questionable, and we've created a product called Signal Quo. Same initials S and Q. That's why. Our our logo's there. It's got four points because Mars, four planet. It's the only thing we have on there. Uh, the name Signal Quo. Our project is related to communications, so Signal as in you know, it's related to communications. And then Quo, which is actually means what is it? Receive from? Yeah, to send or receive. Yeah, to send or receive. So that's what's there. So the first wave of settlers have arrived on Mars. They've established a colony. Um, when all of a sudden there's an extreme weather event and everybody dies. So years later, <laughs> the second attempt. It's a full reset, and this time they bring a backup communication system. So our product is a mesh network that serves as a backup communication system with um, the central hub, the personal transmitters, and the environment monitoring sensors. Dust storms are extremely common on Mars. On average, we're expecting a Mars colony to experience a dust storm at least once a day. These dust storms will be 700 meters in diameter and last for at least 25 minutes. These could cut off primary communication and they could be dangerous for anybody working in the field at the time. <coughs> uh, Misha, so I've got written here, there a uh, piece of metal that's just kind of woven up. Oh. <laughs> Long thing, sorry. Um, so we've been, we're using a mesh system which is based on LoRa. Jasper's designed a custom protocol to go on top of it, which he's calling uh, Hop Trace, because it traces all the hops that the mesh systems do. Um, we're using a mesh so that we don't have to make giant leaps back and forth, and we can deploy wee small nodes that will be based kind of around this, and and uh, make several smaller hops back to the head rather than the big giant leaps. This means that during a dust storm, even if one of those nodes happened to be unavailable, uh, we could use a different path back to the head. Uh, the LoRa modules we're using are running on a low frequency, which will help the signal actually penetrate the dust and get back easier and send the signal to the next. No. Tain also has some more benefits rather than this. Okay, so there are many benefits to a system such as this one, a secondary communication system. This one is um, backup communication is a very important because if a dust storm happens to take out this main communication, this backup communication will be very resilient and will work in, uh, in if there is an unexpected event such as a loss of power. Okay, this will be able to transmit data, it is able to transmit data, from IoT devices such as this weather station here and this personal, monitor, personal device. 
these can send data through, um, through each other and get data back to the main habitat or have with the format. This is, we've built in a warning system. So you can see this big emergency light, a big, big emergency button, and this switch here. This will be able to send alerts between these different, um, different devices to communicate with the different inhabitants of our <coughs> colony. It's modular, so with these little devices that are in here, if you make it another device and add it to the network, it will just expand the network, make it even better and even stronger. It's super long range. One of these devices can go up to 15 kilometers in range on Earth, and uh, on Mars we're expecting it to be even longer because of the difference in the atmosphere. And in the network, in the mesh network, it will be even further. It's super low power, meaning the, the small batteries in here won't need to be replaced, and you can run it in an event of power loss in the main habitat. And, and the last benefit that I'm going to talk about is geolocation and Jasper. Cool. Um, on the uh, how World Douglas has spent like 16 billion putting GPS satellites in the air, which means what if we take location for granted, we, we can plot our phones and we get a precise location within the seconds. On Mars, it's not so easy. There's a few different techniques we need to get our location, and this mesh network implemented one of them called uh, Time Difference of Arrival, where it uses the speed of light and the time to uh, like echo lake location to get the uh, outer nodes and back to measure the distance. That works really well for long distances, but speed of light is fast, so it doesn't really work so well in a tiny little demo environment. So instead, as a proxy, we're using received signal strength. This is just like the Wi-Fi bands on your laptop. It's just how strong the signal is. This is much more susceptible to interference, but works really well in these small spaces. That it gets really compressed as you go further out. So the first couple lines is maybe five meters, last couple, a hundred. And using that data, we'll be able to triangulate any nodes that are sending out distress signals, or uh, using monitoring stations and various other nodes. If we've got a few known positions and distances, we can easily work out where those distress is. I worked on the microcontroller firmware, including the geolocation and that top trace protocol. I worked on the geolocation dashboard and the emergency dashboard. I worked on the electronics for the weather station and the main, main <coughs> um, personal transmitter and the dashboard for the weather. I worked on some of the electronics and then we worked on the dashboard design and the presentation. Sean and I worked here on the design and the concept of CAD um, production and assembly. And each of our modules is mainly made out of 3D printing as a skeleton like this personal module that I have, and we used acrylic for little panels to make the entire thing tight. So now, on to the We go to freestyle. Yeah. 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 The fun part. Mm -hmm. fun part. Mm -hmm. fun part. Mm -hmm. fun part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Here we go. All right, so I'm venturing out into space. I'm going on an EVA. <laughs> Off I go. Trudging on Mars. Oh no, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> Let me check my main communication system. Nope, it's not working. There must be interference from a dust storm. I wonder what I'll do. Good thing I have my signal quo mesh network with emergency backup transmitter. Let me just flick the emergency switch and you'll be able to see here. It sends an emergency network. Anyway, I'll turn that off so you don't have to listen to me anymore. It seems that I actually can get back up. Well, that's a good thing. So. Well done. Yeah, we've got, it's off, it's off. It'll just, yeah. So, what we've got here, I flipped this off. So, should we take these to the table to demonstrate? Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, by the way, you see the flashing green light on the hat? That's every time the packet's going through the network into the gateway. Do you guys want to 
perhaps trigger a dust storm. This is this is me in relation to dust storm. The dust storm. Do you want to go to the dashboard? Oh yeah. So we've also that's our emergency dashboard. We've got the weather live weather station dashboards. So this is me putting dust. Oh no, a dust storm is occurring. Dust. Now. If only someone could press a button to alert our astronauts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I might get caught in the dust. <laughs> 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 I'm perfectly safe now. <laughs> Thanks to Signal Quo's personal transmitter. Um, oh, so you can actually undo a bus? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And an alarm will stop going on. In theory. <laughs> in, uh, the the in, in practice, oh, it's tested so many times. Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah. And you can see the alarm also stops on this. Wow, wow. And should we pass around the personal device? Yeah. Oh, so oh, oh, just pass around oh, the device. Oh, geolocation. Hang on a second. Oh, yeah. Entire other things. Yeah. 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 It's a whole nother dashboard. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so, yeah. I'm going to put this yeah. over here. Okay. Um, so, so let's put the weather station yeah. over there. Stay there for a second. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Hold, hold that for a second. Yes. Okay. So, we've got a prototype of the geolocation. Um, yeah, Matt, Matt's a little bit hard to read, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. So the the personal transmitter is in between the main hub and the weather station. <coughs> and earlier today, it's been showing up on the map, so we're hoping it will do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, so otherwise, you're all coming out. Yep. Can you read the alerts? It's sending an alert. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So we've got one circle. We've got one circle, which this is, this is the geolocation the distance from one of our transmitters. Yeah. Which we would know the exact location of. Cool. Have we, so we have used this. Uh, yeah, have Two to, minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Okay. okay. Plenty of time. Ideally, we should be getting another circle as well, and then we'd have a crossover, so we'd know where yeah. where to go looking. For but that. since since this is deciding that this is the fastest okay. way yeah. to get back to the hub, um, it's going directly there. It, it should. It should get both. But maybe it doesn't. Oh, it does. Yeah, so it does. Yeah, I move closer, and the circle jump smaller because I move closer to time, and I move further this way. Oh, I just it should hope it to get there. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, it's still still just one Why is that Yeah, mine. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see in the in the bottom, uh, the, uh, okay. the top right had the reading. The top right did have the reading of the hour. Calculated down um, calculated distances. We, however, we just haven't um, made the best map just yet. It works. We promise. Yeah, here we have a screenshot. We've got a screenshot. Yeah, we've got a screenshot. Yeah, we've got a screenshot. Oh yeah, and you can just pass yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think my computer's still on the other end. I've got lots of questions. Oh, oh, but I'm not going to give you lots of questions, I'm just going to give you a couple. As okay. comms is my thing, so intelligence, especially in emergency management, is a situation. So, I, the first question I want to ask is regarding the protocol. You created, did you say you created a custom protocol? Is that correct? Here's the thing, yes. I got a emergency slide just for us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's so, cool being prepared. Like um, this protocol, <coughs> its main difference to every other one that I've seen is that it keeps a log of every device that passes through. What this enables is when the uh, packets being passed through the network, it, the hub can see exactly which devices are connected to the alerting device, and it can see the signal strength and the stats from that. It's um, not a great example, but at, at the first one, packets ID, then it's P, that's the topic, um, the, like there's closed braces, braces. that's the hub that's going to do. From is the chip ID, the like MAC address, and uptime is just how long it's been on. The, the ID was my question. Oh, the chip? The, the, the angry answer of it. So my question was going to be, regarding this protocol, yeah. does it have its own individual IDs in regards to each of those modules that are out wherever they are across the planet? Burned into each of these chips is effectively a MAC address yeah. and ID for a MAC address. Yeah. 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 Y
dropping off. So therefore, you can add anything. You can customize it to to, to we'll save anything at any point. Right. Yep. And then on the dashboard, it's then mapped into what type of device it is. Cool. Cool. So, for example, when that device, uh, when the personal device sends the alert, the rest of the devices will show on screen mm -hmm. that is coming from that device. Unfortunately, I think all the screens are locked to that. Need that one? If we if we activate it from here, um, it will show a look from here. Should we get yes. that? Hold on, I've just done that. Yep. Press the button. You want to press the button? You want to press the button? Okay. <laughs> 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 it's incredibly structurally integral. Yeah, that's alert from home. Yes. I do want to ask a technical question because we've come this far, so we might all just push yep. you a bit further, right? Because um, you've had to think about this and work with this all week. Regarding the radio spectrum, and I know you would have had this conversation, obviously we have interference, especially when it comes to comms, okay, and comms signals across the board. Um, when certain things happen and certain events hit us, we'll have different types of interference. Depending on um, if we're surrounded by mountains and valleys, all that sort of thing, or if there's other Wi-Fi signals, we're going to get that interference. Where does the frequency sit on the radio spectrum? We're running at 433 megahertz, Sweet. which isn't normal for the LoRa module that we're using. Um, it's just because I've got some, we bought some kind of outdated um, for modules. Most of the newer ones actually have higher frequency, but more frequency. lower frequency should help their straight uh, dust to better. So what would be the interfering signals then if it sits in that space on a radio spectrum? Um, here, it will just be generally... In Mars. Oh, on Mars? On Mars. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Mars, there's going to be no magnetic fields, which means you can just get EMF in space. But that EMF should be a pretty low frequency, especially compared to our 433 megahertz. So from our research, it seems like there wouldn't be any major meaningful impact. Um, not anything that's going to count the gates by the atmosphere and lack of other devices such as GPS. That's a dumb question from your stuff into the When you're talking about megahertz, oh, is this the electro electromagnetic waves frequencies? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, 433 are usually used for garage door openers. Yeah. <laughs> on Earth, obviously. Not Mars garage door So we have the Martian I mean, would you want a garage door in your Martian habitat? How else do you want to store it? How about I store my store up? How about I store my Just a question around why did you have to end up writing your own protocol versus using something off the shelf? Um, well, I really, okay, we really did not intend to. Um, so, Albert, hang on a second, our government is his life. Okay, so. We have four different things available to us. We had LoRa, Wi-Fi, Solia, and um, we did not have satellite devices, like three things. But the reason that we ended up writing our own protocol is because ours is kind of a bit more fundamentally different than other protocols out there. Usually what you have is maybe a couple of devices out in the field and you'll have those, these gateways spread out all over the place. But with ours, we've got a single hub and we've got nodes spread out all over the place, which makes things like geolocation a bit harder. Every research paper I come, we came, came across, um, it looks like they were using a whole bunch <coughs> of different gateways around to do the time difference of the uh, while we had to do a thing in and out because we didn't we only have one hub, we only have one Martian habitat visitor. Uh, the first group didn't go so well. <laughs> Awesome. I have a question. Do you have any more emergency sites? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have my Laura. Uh, we have the protocol. We have a ground truth web. So when we are calibrating the distance, this is the dust that we got from our signal. Uh, we have the equation in very low resolution. I was just going to say, have you got a slide on the equation? Oh, I love it. Uh, 
Our aim with this project is to provide um, a, a spacesuit that would monitor and track an astronaut's vital signs and other statistics around the suit and outside, that, and it gets relayed instantly back to the colony so that they can see and track if they would find, if they're dying somewhere. Um, and so if they are dying somewhere, then they can provide a timely and adequate response and hopefully get out of trouble for them. Uh, to achieve this, we've added some sensors into our vest. Sensors on the, into the inside and outside of our vest. So sensors on the inside of the vest give us information about the person who's wearing the vest. Data we collect from this includes heartbeat monitoring, which is important to know because if the heart rate's high, then that could indicate that you're doing exercise or something like that, you're running away from something. Or if it's lower, that could indicate that you're passed out or sleeping, or if it's zero, that could be dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're also collecting temperature, which would give an indication of the super insulation chip still, that's still working, to what could be bad or too low, you could indicate heart failure. Uh, we're also collecting air quality, so we're collecting uh, carbon dioxide levels. That's important because high carbon dioxide levels can result in passing out, or, uh, and then obviously that problem's not fixed, that could eventually die from uh, lack of oxygen. Uh, we also collect humidity and air pressure. Air pressure is another important metric because it allows it allows us 
to detect a leak in the suit uh, that could potentially be in the atmosphere out, so that would be indicated by a decrease over time in the air pressure. The sensor readings are seen every five seconds through the, uh, the status quo of the previous group, but they are more in the air. The um, hop trace program. Hop trace, I've got <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we've also added a deployable weather station so that the colonists have places place this on the ground rather than instantly get environmental readings from outside their suit. This collects dust levels, pressure readings, CO2 levels, temperature, and humidity levels. Dust levels are the most important for this one because that can indicate a dust storm. So if there were a dust storm approaching, you would probably want to leave the area as quick as possible. Uh, these readings are sent to our backpack every five seconds via a radio, and then that's forwarded onto the uh, Hagerpop Tracks network. Originally, the outside sensors were to be held in a box uh, where a solar panel would be placed on top of the box. But uh, so that the solar panel would be able to charge the box while walking around, so you would have to put the base every so often. But uh, as the prototype was too small to be able to fit the solar panel on the top of the Uh, cool, so I've been done with 3D modelling, so that's for the electronics boxes, the weather station here, and then the box that's in uh, Anna Hull's back, back, I'll show you that shortly. Uh, I've also done the uh, programming and electronics for connecting up to the uh, trace hop network. <coughs> um, so I've been doing electronic programming, so I programmed the dashboard that you'll see soon, that displays all the data, and I've also worked a lot with the microprocessors in here and there that read the sensors and try to I'm Michael. I program and hooked up the sensors to all the weather stations and the backpacks. I'm Angie, and I designed the concepts for the product and the guests. So we're going to give you guys a live demo of the dashboard now. So let's watch the first of which portion. Yeah, so I'm going to put the weather station inside. So let's see the weather station. And you'll see the the temperatures will go down, that's just 0.1 degrees. Put it outside, hopefully, and the CO2 will go down as well. It has like a few seconds to start. So we're on the weather station. Yeah, so the CO2 is already going down. So you can see the CO2 starts to go down. Temperature reading should start to go down. You'll probably see humidity probably increase since it's been raining a bit. So temperature might not go down that for a bit. It's actually quite warm outside. We can go back to it later. Yes, yeah, like so we'll switch to the, degrees. We're going to switch to the so outside yeah. sensors for the backpack. So this is in this backpack. It wouldn't be on top, but that's this part of it. Yeah. So <laughs> obviously it's in the backpack, so it's warmer. And you guys get the CO2, and then you would be it's up there in line in five seconds. So, okay. And then we've got in the suit, this is the sensor section. We've got two temperature readings, like, readings which are around 34 degrees, because they would be 30 centimeters, but they're through the suit for this. And yeah. heart monitor, which is actually one of the wires. He's got these CG leads on, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got nervous! <laughs> 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 oh. and, uh, All right, man. <laughs> 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 and 
Uh, so health is another is a highly important factor to consider in any space, uh, especially places where living circumstances are much more dangerous in comparison to Earth. Humans aren't able to sustain proper living environments on Mars without the help of technology, and sustaining proper health is really important. As Mars is much less hazardous than Earth, there are more hazards to consider, and especially ones that aren't currently known to us. One of our project allows colonists at the base station to check on the health vitals of those who venture outside really easily, and that will show whether they're in critical condition, if they're healthy, or if they're just regular, uh, just healthy. There are only there are limited colonists, and, ex and as exploration on Mars is recent, new diseases or illnesses can <coughs> out, but may not appear visibly, so diagnosing them could be hard. And being able to Determine different condi conditions of other colonists could lead to aiding to health increases or potentially further research. Mm. Yeah, so there are a few future improvements we would make in this. Obviously, two already mentioned salt panel will be on the box. Um, there will be more sensors, potentially, uh, obviously, a Geiger counter, maybe a UV sensor, because that's also something that you'll get a lot of on Mars. Um, another thing is we could have a heads up display either on the visor or the watch so that the public can monitor their own vitals because sometimes it's hard to tell that we're not doing so well. Um, there would be the sensors in an actual space, which is not just a vest, because you would die if you went into more than that. Um, we could use possibly smart textiles so that it's much more integrated to the vest, and those can detect motion, temperature, and other stuff. And then one more thing is, we'd probably have a better way to get the box and the ribbon wire to break out. <laughs> Um, I've got a question. Um, how are you currently communicating from the device back to the dashboard? Ah, uh, so that's over the. <coughs> the you're actually using the yes, network. Yes, we're actually using the network. Yes. Which. Yeah. So, so that is good. This is not too much stuff to overload. No, 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 right. No. Did you guys know are they helping this work? Or are they so? You? Yeah. So we were using to, to actually get the data. So what they have with the help trace network is when they receive their data, they put it onto a server called MQTT which we can easily read from. And so as a backup, we had our own MQTT server, and that's over Wi-Fi, so the boards we have in the box can actually communicate by Wi-Fi. So that didn't work. We had a fallback and we could quickly still get it running. So, so for the presentation, it's currently going through the law. Yes, it's going through that. You could probably run 
able to see the uh, yeah, it's him he's going through there. Yeah. So but if that, if, let's say that wasn't working because they did something wrong, like, so that you actually could have connected through the Wi Fi for the dead tracking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it does to the best. I just thinking, I, I think you mentioned this before, I like the fact that you've got smart textiles in there because that's what we're all looking at at the moment, especially when it comes to um, monitoring and, and, and that sort of thing. What other different um, types of materials would you use? Did you research it though? Did you have a look at what, what other types of materials that you could possibly use? It would, yeah, it would, it would be integrated into just a spacesuit usually. So it, it wouldn't be a fit if you just had it in the actual spacesuit itself. Yeah. So it would be. Yeah. So what would that spacesuit be made out of? What, what did you think about that? Did you suit? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think, I I think you mentioned it briefly, but I just kind of. What about um, the data privacy of it? You've obviously got some sensitive data around heart rates and internal um, body temperatures and that, and that kind of thing. Do you, have you thought about how this data personally, but you're obviously sending all this data back to, to Mars, to this one, one big server that potentially everyone wants to use the data for, right? Because everyone's really keen on using this data. How, how do you make sure that the individual doesn't feel um, less vulnerable to what, what they're sending back? So, funnily enough, we have had the discussion because they didn't have to steal our data. They have stolen our data. They have. But so it wouldn't be hard to incorporate modern encryption technology into the packets. Like, there's enough bandwidth to handle it, and it's, it, it wouldn't be too tricky to actually encrypt it. So, only certain people, so it would still be set the cops safe from anywhere, but only certain people would be able to actually read what the data has. What, and maybe thoughts to anonymization of the data as well? Um, that's something like that. Yeah, like once it's, uh, we could store it in a database and completely anonymize it, so the only thing that would actually be like this person's data would be on the live dashboard, so you'd other data set in real time if um, who the person was. And then we could potentially also have a login system for everyone, so you could give uh, missions to say this person can view my data, this person can view my data in real time. Yeah. And, and that, I guess that could also extend to the way data is presented, right? So in terms of what's, what's appropriate to people in terms of if someone's um, fallen sick or something like that, then the alert may be just someone's fallen sick, but then maybe the right the right permission can actually read their heart rate and that's yeah. I assume it's a battery powering the, um, the on person device. Um, yes. How much straw is there on it and how long do you put that? How, what type of battery would you need to last? We have a really big like battery in the moment that is 20,000 milliamp hours. Right. It's just a regular power bank. Yeah. But um, we can have, with, for the solar panel, we can get about five watts ish on Earth. It would probably be lower or higher on Mars. But um, it should last quite a bit of time because it's not drawing all that much power. Lowering it looks pretty. Like, um, doesn't draw much power, and the sensors all don't draw very much power. Yes. The great thing about using specific types of materials to do things like spacesuits, exosuits, all that kind of stuff, is that really good materials may hold charge, will make, generate more charge as you move in. And it's why it's good to look at the, the base foundation materials that you use. How do you know so much stuff? I, I pull a lot of it out of my ass. It's really <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Uh, one, one question for me. Have you considered machine learning for predictive health monitoring? So, for example, you might not actually be sick at the moment, but you can yeah. notice trends over time. Yeah, so Anatol sort of mentioned that, like, we could use that data to feed into algorithms like that, then we could. Yeah, exactly. Predict what sort of thing. Yeah, so, yeah, that could feedback. Like the algorithm might be that is that we train. Yeah. 
feedback directly into the forms and other fields.
um, it takes our users away from their screens and encourages more face-to-face -face and physical interactions. Oh, now you get to see. <coughs> <laughs> so, what we've done with our product, what we've done with you, is we have gamified social interaction. Again, with the purpose of protecting our users' mental health and reinforcing power within our users. We've done this by creating a bespoke tabletop game, drawing our users away from their workspaces and creating a competitive social atmosphere. So just going over some of the design choices, you can see we've got user interactive buttons, we've got a display for the score, underneath here we've got the control system, and when we invite you up to have a look, you'll see the ramps and our, our graphics on the board itself. Um, so we've chosen fun colours and simple materials with the aim of making the game as approachable to as many people as possible. We want each and every person on the Martian <coughs> colony to be able to use our product. The pastel blue and pink colours promote a light and airy feel for the user. The wooden frame creates a much more down-to-earth feeling, with the natural materials being polar opposites to the man-made materials that surround our colonists. The bright LED lights create visual intrigue for the onlookers, creating an interactive experience for more than just the players. We want as many people involved in our game as possible. So, how do we play? It's a very simple game, it's very easy to understand, and that again goes back to our philosophy of being as accessible to as many people as we can. The aim of the game is to get the ball into the goal on the other side of the board. You cannot move past your area, and once the target is hit, you get one point. The first player to ten points wins. There are three different types of ramps, which you can see in our diagram. There's the peak ones, there's the slightly shorter one, and there's the long one in the middle. Um, these come with different difficulties to get over each one. The rules for the game are simple, which makes it approachable, however, they can also be easily manipulated to fit different playstyles. So, who would like to have a turn? <laughs> <laughs> yes. One, yes more, one more person? Come on, you go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That was how you know where you'd be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll okay, just cool. So who, okay, so who, how do you just uh, determine who goes first? Who just goes first? Gang, gang, more? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> and you can go at any which way. Any way you want. Yeah, the ramps are um, oh, optimized for Martian gravity. I can't gravity. get in some corners. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get, get some corners in there. Okay? So yeah. That's why we've got these really steep ramps, because in Martian gravity, they're designed to flip right up and come down. Oh, what's my thing? Oi! <laughs> 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 Sorry, Martian gravity. Okay. No! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you can do this. Wait. 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 Hey! Oh no! Get away from there. Okay, just gonna get you off the wall. Do you know what would be great? Add some sounds to it. Like, add some music. Ah. Oh. oh, come here. Oh no! Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Dudu has various electronics to enhance the Dudu has various electronics to enhance the experience of the game. These are all controlled by an Arduino in this box, connected to a custom-made circuit board um, that we designed ourselves. The circuit board connects to these two arcade buttons that to receive their signals and to light up the LEDs here. The scoreboard is a dot matrix display made up of 512 LEDs arranged in a grid that is 32 by 16 LEDs. The driver boards under the scoreboard uh, communicate with the Arduino using SPI. The LED strip around here is made up of 120 LEDs and it is addressable allowing us to control each LED individually. In the scoreboard, the numbers and letters are scored in bitmaps. 
The electronics are not necessarily a part of the game, but they uh, increase visual entry and attractiveness of the game. So if the electronics are shut down, there's a power outage, or anything happens to the electronics, the game can still be played. Um, if the players also want to disconnect from the tech, since their job is very tech-based, they can also turn off the electronics themselves. So why not another game? This is a really simple and easy game to learn. Um, it helps to make it suitable for a wider range of people to use it. Um, this, this, makes the, this helps the master learners to build greater connections with the people around them and have lots of fun. Uh, with the invention of new technology and devices, there's less face-to-face -face interaction. So we want to encourage more physical and face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and um, encourages social interaction and uses movement of the hands, which is not seen as much with the Mars rugby, which we mm -hmm. uh, Mars rugby is very physical, mostly like body movements, and this one is more focused on smaller hand movements, and um, we thought that's what was missing. Um, it draws, a, it draws people out of a busy working environment and creates a better work pleasure balance, ultimately improving their mental health. This game is very engaging and it will be sensational for people of all ages. Martin's already has a very good game which I already mentioned, so we wanted to focus on the smaller games. So, um, of course, <clears throat> of course, we're a new sapling colony on Mars. Data is very important to us. The, uh, the, data with, the data we're collecting from our users is very important to us to optimize the life on Mars from our colonists. So what are we going to be collecting? Firstly, how many of our colonists are actually using the game? What is the, it is all well and good that we're providing them with the tools to do this, but how many people are actually interacting with it? How successful is it within our colony? We think that would be really important to track off. Secondly, who are each of our colonists playing against? Are they playing within a small group of friends or are they playing within a larger group? This could give us insight to how social networks are evolving within our colony, right? And we think this would be beneficial moving forwards. Again, so that we're making sure pockets of our colony are not isolated. Uh, this would be a very important thing to have. Lastly, mood and satisfaction before and after the game. Obviously, we want to be in improving our settlers' mood, our settlers' moods, and we want to be increasing their satisfaction. Uh, future improvements. Let's see. Future improvements. On Mars, the acceleration due to gravity is lower, so we may need to add acrylic barriers to prevent the ball from bouncing out. <laughs> um, this will also make the game a little more chaotic because the ball is bouncing around and a lot more fun. Um, we think adding more lights onto it may increase the visual attractiveness on, of it and making it a bit more similar to and ball, very flashy and makes it draw, sort of draws you to the game and again make it more chaotic and more fun. If we add more targets other than just the goals, this could perhaps make the strategy more complex and that means that the game may have more depth and it may be more interesting to watch. Um, we could also include new courses, changing up these ramps for different types of ramps or even putting walls or ramp ramps that are actuated pneumatically to improve the chaoticness and fun of the game. We could, instead of having arcade buttons to keep score, we could put an ultrasonic sensor in here, and as the ball passes through, that would uh, count the score on the scoreboard, but we didn't do it because it was unreliable. Um, in future, once the game is established and the population starts to increase through the thousands, we hope to have a professional debut league, and marshals <laughs> <laughs> will gather um, from throughout the, the base to watch the professional DVD players play. This will end up being a place where they can unwind and relax after a long, hard day of living on Mars. Um, there are lots of future ideas for further development of our project. Uh, so we're going to a lot from the project. Cool. Thank you. Any questions? It's very beautiful. How do you plan to get it to Mars? <clears throat> on a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the beauty of all of our, our parts is that a lot of them are 3D printed, and with the assumption that we're going to have rapid manufacturing technologies on Mars, a lot of it could actually be made on Mars, and the rest of our parts are 
relatively two dimensions, so it can flat back on the rocket ship going into Mars. Yes, Especially yeah. as these, these ramps are 3D printed, they could actually design the new quarters on Mars, yeah. manufacture the ramps, you know, sell them, add to the economy as well. Mm -hmm. Um, just from that was really fun. By the way, one I really like that you could address something that's not nearly obvious from people on Mars. Just fun. Yes. And just, yes. And we can all be engineers and think about the practicalities of just surviving and living. But it's actually really living. So that's I really like that you address that question that often gets missed. Just from our um, demonstration though, mm -hmm. what are some improvements that you could see that, that let's say you had another two days to 3D print a few more pieces, but some immediate improvements that you can see that you could implement. Maybe we would make Earth, Earth ramps, we sort of made the steep ramps we thought they would pop up as Mars gravity was sort of designed for Mars, but I think it would also add more strong magnets. Mm -hmm. I think also we could add like a system to make sure the balls don't get stuck in the corners. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, or like on the corners of the ramps. I think that would be really something that we could add into. Oh, that's that's it. It was just a matter of running out of time for play testing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but of course, after this, you all can keep playing. <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's only a week, and we were just trying to get a concept down and looking nice rather than really, really refining it, which would take months and months. Yeah. But that's that's yeah. hard to point, you know, trying to get something down early, yeah. just yeah. early to get the early information yeah. to quickly mitigate something. Yeah, for the comes, yeah. Um, maybe it's more throwaway. I mean, you mentioned replacing the ramps and things, but presumably you can also replace the paddles as well. Yes, They're quite yes. difficult. They look like radar at yeah. the higher level of skill. Um, and potentially, I know, I know if I'm going to play the game, I want something that's a hand, hand sized paddle. Well, <laughs> well, that's, 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 paddles can't be smaller than the goals, otherwise, we'll just put the paddles right yeah, on the goal. That's fair. Yeah. We'll keep practicing, maybe you can end up in the competitive league. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a quick question. Where can I buy one? <laughs> uh, so like we said at the moment, it's currently bespoke, but of course, uh, talk to us at the end, maybe we can work out a deal. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, um, what happens when someone wins? Is there like a celebratory... Um, yeah, so if we just increase the score... score. You know the questions all the way in? Yeah. <laughs> just white questions going on. Yeah, I did. Actually, no, you've already answered it. You, you talk, I was going to ask you about a video tournament, and you, know, you mentioned the video league, and I was like, well played. Yeah, because it is. Literally. Like, like, like <laughs> sport, and, and especially in New Zealand, because the free prison and Aotearoa context, sport is such a big part of our lives. Yeah. So, there you go. Hey. Hey. The sport is such a big part of our lives, <laughs> and it's, it's a real uh, way that we come together as New Zealanders to, to celebrate something, you know. Everyone goes to the rugby games, watches the rugby, and just loves it, goes wild. Especially at uni, people will do that. So it's, it's something that we can sort of bond around, and that's what took, sort of, took a bit of inspiration for this uh, project. Yeah, we're hoping that once our colony becomes a bit more established with games like this, they can start to form their own identity. And they can do the We just took it to identity. Okay. <laughs> I like how inclusive your design is because you don't actually you don't require certain physical abilities no, to play. Really. Anyone can play, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That that was one of our key points throughout the whole time. We didn't want it to be a physical game because people want to be able to. You know, most people on Mars would be able to move the thing around, but some people aren't. But that, some people are. You know, it's very accessible. Very cool. If you had unlimited funds. Yes. <laughs> Thinking about the, the questions already been asked about how do we improve this game. Yeah. But if you had unlimited funds and you were thinking about mixed media, would you add it? What do you mean? Uh, mixed, mixed reality? Mixed, like mixed reality. That doesn't have to be VR or whatever, whatever. Just would you add anything like that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Because we're talking about it also being a spectator sport, right? Yeah. We could have we could have big, we could have even more flashy lights. We can have designs on the whole board. We can have special effects on the. <clears throat> paddle and the ball, and it can it can really become much more of a spectacle right. than it currently is, and it can become a lot more entertaining. We also must consider that when we have um, got uh, with our goal is to gamify social interaction, so we can't be taking the mixed reality too far as that it removes that social interaction between the Martians. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Yeah, I definitely think mixed reality would add a lot of new dimension to the game and mm -hmm. really make it more engaging for people. Mm -hmm. And keep you like out of their work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 How are you going to put this in the IBS locker? Don't stay here. I live in Christchurch. Oh, I can take that home. <laughs> cool. Right. Any more questions? Contact out.
So this is our friend Gilbert. Gilbert has unfortunately had a heart attack. And Gilbert needs to be resuscitated with the help of the mobile defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, just do one, just do one, just do one. Just do one, just do one. Okay. We don't need 200 volts. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh, it's a nice day. We'll get it. Someone get ready to catch it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guys, guys, guys. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, oh. This better work. We haven't, haven't tasted it. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 No, 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 I knew it was going to be a lot. I'll take a shot. I'll take How long did you spend in development for this product? One hour. Half an hour last night. Oh, my bad, my bad. Well, that's the way to do what we've done. Yeah, from all the way here. Okay, yeah, ready? Okay, go.